Okay, next we'll hear from John O'Brien, who's the Vice President for Public Policy at Care, for, Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. Welcome. Thank, thanks, Peter. I, to some of you, I'm known as the other John O'Brien. I'm not the John O'Brien at OPM. I'm not the John O'Brien at SAMHSA or CMCS. I'm now the John O'Brien at Care First. Um, I'm told that the cool kids don't begin their presentations with jokes. They actually take a picture of the audience and they Instagram it. So since this is my first time at the National Academy of Medicine, I will do that now. Thank you. <laughs> we are taking pictures of the slides. So um, thank you again. It's great to be here. I, I certainly bring the greetings of my colleague, John Blum, who unfortunately uh, wishes he could be here with you today but can't, uh, and our CEO, Chet Burrell, who I know personally cares very deeply about the number of things that, that I've heard this morning. I also want to thank Jeremy and Deborah Ness for reminding us this morning about why, why we're here uh, about five minutes into his presentation, I thought I brought the wrong slides. About five minutes after his presentation, I was calling headquarters. I'm saying, do we cover this? How do we cover that? How do we think about this? Um, so while I, I hear everyone say how important it is to have a patient involved in your meeting, I, I never really appreciated just how it really framed the speaker's remarks until I heard that today. So thank you. For the last five years, Care First has uh, offered a, a patient-centered medical home, really the, the first and largest of its kind at the hub of a total care and cost improvement initiative to improve the quality and lower the cost of our members with multiple chronic conditions. Now, I proudly wear both my patient advocate hat alongside my health insurance executive hat and say that while our program doesn't close all the gaps or cover all the things that I heard earlier today that, that need to be covered, I really do believe that, that we get it uh, and that our program looks at the whole patient, uh, certainly covers the four quadrants that we heard Dr. Chernoff speak about today, uh, and I've heard few uh, discuss the link between behavioral health and substance abuse and medical care and medical cost trend the way that our CEO, Chet Burrell, does, and certainly the benefits and the programs that we offer in our PCMH and TCCI program really uh, back up his belief in that. Um, our program, I'm not sure if this really works or if she just sees us press it and she moves <laughs> it forward. Um, so our, our program, again, launched in, in 2008. We have about a million attributed members of, of our 3.4. Uh, we actually break our, our program up in the state of Maryland into regions. So the care, nurse care coordinators that we hire are specifically hired from the region so that they have a relationship of not just the local culture that they're in, but also the physicians and the healthcare institutions in the area. Uh, those 20 regions span Maryland, D.C., and Northern Virginia. We currently have about 4,000 enrolled, and I want to check some acronyms here, uh, 4,000 enrolled primary care physicians and nurse practitioners, both of whom we refer to as primary care providers who are capable of forming and operating a panel on their own. So again, sort of speaking of the importance of nurse practitioners in primary care, they operate 425 medical panels with about 2,500 uh, patients per 300 nurse care coordinators who, who served to, to sort of keep the program together. And in 2013, we uh, really were, I think, the only insurer in that round to receive a CMMI Healthcare Innovation Award. And we're currently testing our PCMH model for now about 38,000 beneficiaries across 14 panels uh, with 44 nurse care coordinators. I won't present this slide the way Melinda told us not to present it this morning. We, we certainly do know um, of the link between illness burden and PMPM uh, across our population, and those data are shown for you here. What we don't do is use illness burden score as the only way someone can get into our program or get access to our advanced care coordination services. Rather, Illness burden score is something that helps us meet the patient where they are, uh, find out where they are in, in their healthcare journey, and be able to prioritize and target the services that are best for them. One of the more interesting applications or, or gaps, if you will, in uh, the use of illness burden scores is in the exchange population. So here you have people who heretofore have been uninsured and therefore don't really have any claims experience, so their illness burden score using DXCG or HCC or other measures would be 0.0. Uh, they get access to the healthcare system. The primary care physician or the nurse care coordinator notices a whole bunch of things that are going on. They, they get them the care that they need, and, and then their illness burden score jumps. So uh, that's something that, 
that we've identified as sort of a new opportunity for improvement uh, and also speaks to the importance of illness burden score not being the key to the front door, but rather one way that someone can enter our program. Any physician or any nurse care coordinator can refer someone to our PCMH program or any of our TCCI elements uh, because they think it's the right thing for that patient. So our program is built around the patient and through the primary care provider who really only represent about 6% of our billing. However, the decisions that are made by the primary care provider represent really the rest of the cost or, or the claims that we pay and the opportunities for quality improvement that, that we face. So we built our program around the primary care physician, and we empower them with credible data and analytic support significant meaningful financial incentives, and high-touch superior clinical support. So what, what that by and large looks like on the financial side, we take their attributed patient historical budget, we risk adjust it, and we trend it forward, and we give them a budget target. We first pay them an additional 12% bump on top of their fee-for-service claims for all of their members for whom they uh, agree to be in the program. So if a physician says, I wanna be one of your PCMH providers, we pay them 12% on top of all the fee-for-service claims for all of their patients. We then pay them $200 to develop a care plan and $100 to maintain the care plan. That can be paid monthly uh, for developing and updating care plans for the patients who need the PCMH services and the care coordination. We also reward them with an outcome incentive award or shared savings that is paid at the intersection of the quality score that they achieve and the cost savings that they achieve against their target budget. And we'll touch on the OIAs a little bit later. We also give them access to an incredible suite of data and analytics report that we refer to as Searchlight that really uses claims and other information to help them do hot spotting across their population that then links to a service request hub that they can use to make referrals or request additional services. And then we support all of that with the 300 nurse care coordinators who really serve as the interface between the patient, the physician, the care plan, and the rest of, uh, I'll say the community. I don't just mean the healthcare community, but I mean the community writ large. Uh, and then we also support the physicians with about 22 program consultants. So these are kind of like uh, health wonks like us who go into physician practices and share with them the data that they have access to in Searchlight. Uh, and it's the equivalent of not waiting until the final exam to find out how you're doing in the class. Rather, it's the opportunity very early in the quarter to say, can't help but notice you're not engaging with the program. And if you're not engaging with the program, you're not gonna achieve shared savings. What can we do to help you engage with the program? So the PCMH program is, is at the center of the, the total care and cost improvement program. And the nurse care coordinator, again, sort of works to, to keep that all together. Um, I, I really want to speak to something that I, that I heard earlier about. Uh, the LCC, when they recognize that there may be something missing, um, whether it's at, at the time of, of a hospital transition or, or as a result of, of a care plan conversation with the primary care physician, they can request a, a home-based service or a home-based consult. And, and that, then a registered nurse goes into the home, looks for fall risk, looks for gaps in care, looks for medication adherence or the lack of a caregiver. And, and that's what helped me appreciate the story earlier about transportation you know, sometimes medication adherence is something that we can fix through a pharmacist and comprehensive medication review and medication therapy management. Sometimes it's because they need to take three buses to get to the pharmacy. So we use that paradigm to sort of ask ourselves what's going on with this patient's care and how can we support them uh, and really support that, that true team-based loop. So if you um, go to the next slide for me, <laughs> that happened just by thinking about it. Um, th this slide, this is awesome. I love this place. 
this slide shows um, how, how our program is actually broken up in, in, into panels. And, and I mentioned that, that shared savings are based on the panel's performance, not the individual panel, not the individual physician performance. And the panels can be part of a large health system. It can be a subset of physicians in a large group practice, or it can be a self-formed panel of small independent physician practices. And not only is that the basis for shared savings, not only is it more actuarially stable, it also creates sort of a, a peer feedback and team-based loop. And inevitably, there's the emergence of a panel champion, uh, that, that physician or nurse practitioner or even office manager sometime that really understands the data and gets how the program works and really starts whipping, if you will, um, the other physicians uh, to, to work within the confines of the program and, and help the patients adhere to the care plan. These are the tiers of our quality measure scorecard. Uh, we use a, a number of, of claims-based and outcomes-based measures. It includes patient survey measures as well as staff evaluations of the program. Something we started last year is the requirement that if you're not engaging with the program and earning at least 22 out of the 35 points in the engagement realm, and, and you're not using the services and the supports that we provide you to, to help your patients, you're not eligible to earn the outcome incentives awards, and, and that caused a number of conversations uh, amongst our panels about how to more robustly use the program. This eye chart is essentially just a, a list of what it looks like inside Searchlight. So if a physician clicks on something on the left, they can pull up a hot spotting list, they can identify patients who are taking multiple medications or have a high drug volatility score, they can then use Icentric to refer that patient to a pharmacist for MTM consult, as well as identify really any other metric you can think of within the program. This controversial slide uh, summarizes something that I heard earlier about specialist use. We use claims on medical episodes and procedures to help primary care docs understand which of their specialists are low, medium, and high cost. That's led to a number of conversations between specialists and TCPs about why they are red, yellow, or green. We can talk about that at, at happy hour. Um, from, from a results perspective, I'm trying to go back just one slide for my final thoughts to say that we've had a steadily increasing number of panels receiving shared savings, a steadily increasing size of the shared savings. About 40% of the panels have earned a streak bonus for achieving shared savings uh, in each of their years. We actually predicted over a medical trend in 14 to be 3.5%. Uh, I say stay tuned because we're now seeing that in the PCMH population, 2013 compared to 2014, that trend is actually about 1%. And I'll close just with, with a very quick run through to say that our program is reducing readmissions, it's reducing length of stay, it's reducing readmissions and outpatient facility visits, uh, it's bending the cost curve. And uh, I, I really believe that our program is about meeting patients where they are, supporting and empowering uh, physicians, and, and providing the types of services that we heard about today. So thanks again for the opportunity to be here. Great. Thank